Good morning, everybody. My name is Rob Packard. Today's training is the five tools for conducting root cause analysis. If you're like me, you've been up at f since 5 a.m. this morning and you've been studying root cause analysis day in, day out for the last month, and you are an expert. If not, maybe you need this training. So here we go. Uh, slide two. Why? Why do you need root cause analysis? Well, the first reason why you need root cause analysis is in order to write a kappa, you need to know what the root cause is. Otherwise, whatever you plan for corrective actions might not fix the problem. That's the only reason why you really need root cause analysis. And it's not sufficient just to write what the root cause is. You actually have to investigate it. There's a process involved to figure out what the root cause is. It's very seldom that it's inherently obvious what the problem is. So, when do you perform a root cause analysis? Well, do not wait until the day before your corrective action plan is due. Not a good plan because, as I just said, it takes a while. There's a process involved. There are things you have to do in order to figure out what the root cause is. That's also why notified bodies and the FDA don't allow you to get out of a 43 or get out of a nonconformity finding by correcting it during the audit. That's just a correction. That's not going to prevent it from happening again. So, for the FDA, their policy is 15 working days, so basically three weeks from the date that you receive the 43, and it's printed right on the 43, so you know what day it is. Do not send it in a day late. That makes bad things happen, including warning letters. Number two, 30 calendar days is the norm for most ISO registrars, so just a little bit longer than the 21 days or 15 working days for the FDA, but not a lot longer. So those are two benchmarks you can use. You will not find anywhere in the QSR or in 1345 where it says how many days you have to come up with a corrective action plan and identify the root cause. However, it should be risk-based. So if it's created by the FDA or a notified body, I recommend you have them be the same time frame for both just so you get in the practice of it. You only have FDA inspections every other year. You have ISO registrar, registration and audits every year, so it gives you some practice for if you have to do it for the FDA. So I recommend doing it very quickly on that 15-day working cycle. But you can write your procedure so it gives you a little bit more flexibility and use a risk-based approach. So if things are ridiculously busy or there's something more urgent going on, like a recall or something like that, um, maybe a vacation, an anniversary, Whatever it is, you can buy yourself time with the procedure, but make it risk-based. Risk -based. So you need some way of documenting that. But give yourself time, but don't give yourself too much time. And whenever you can, practice the 15-day fire drill, because when it is real, you really have to be good at this. When, um, when you create a CABA form, so the form that you're recording your corrective action plans on, these are all the things that should be in it, and I've documented a, or I've referenced a form number there. That's found in the CAPA toolkit. So if you take my CAPA course, rather than just this quick training on root cause analysis, um, you will actually get the CAPA toolkit for free. That includes a CAPA procedure, a risk analysis uh, tool used for analyzing risk of CAPAs. It also includes a CAPA form. So you're getting those things as well as the slide deck, as well as the training, all for the cost of $129, which is a lot less than my procedure, which is $300. So you're actually getting quite a deal there. But the place in that form that you really were looking at here is the investigation of root cause. Right below it, there's a place to state concisely what the root cause is, but the investigation is the key part. And then I've referenced at the bottom of this slide here an article I wrote about the 15 tips for creating an effective CAPA form. And that's where what I wrote in preparation for creating my own CAPA form. So what do you document for root cause? Number one, you can't just look at the thing that the auditor or inspector found. You have to expand your search to look at other records on other product lines, other equipment, other people. If it's a person's training record, you don't just look at that person's training records. You look at other training records. You want to expand the scope to see how big the problem is. If you find nothing else anywhere else, then you can say this is a very small problem and take an appropriate corrective action that's small. But if it's 
if you show that it's in many places, now you have a systemic problem that you need to take a much bigger corrective action for. Another question that comes up, and in, in oftentimes people just don't even think about this, is how far back do I need to go? And a lot of times the only reason why they think of this is because the FDA has sent them a warning letter that says your uh, response is inadequate because you didn't consider going back to the last whatever date. Um, so expand your search until occurrences stop. So if the root cause happens to be we changed the procedure and we accidentally deleted an important thing in there when we made that change, so as you go back and search, you're going to get to that point where the change occurred and say, oh, well, this is where it must have occurred because the occurrences stop at this point. And that's where you hunt for the root causes when the occurrences stop. Another solution is until you find a root cause, you go back, you go back, you go back, oh, this is where it occurred. Um, but it, sometimes the problem always existed, like we never had a procedure for that or we, we never were trained on that, so it's always been a problem. In that case, the typical expectation by the FDA is to go back to the last FDA inspection, so approximately two years back, but if they haven't been there for three years, it could be longer but typically to the last inspection. If it's an ISO surveillance audit or a recertification audit, usually back to the last one. So uh, the, your ISO auditors might ask you to go further, it might ask you to go back two years or something, but the idea is to go back to make sure that you haven't got previous occurrences that you need to fix as well. And if you don't go back far enough, this is what the wording might look like in your warning letter. Here are a couple of examples of root cause analysis uh, tools. So there are five of them that I present here. There are other root cause analysis tools out there. These are the most common ones. Uh, some of them are overused. But the one thing that I want to really emphasize here is one size does not fit all. You can't use the 5Y analysis for all root cause analysis or any of the others. So don't write your procedure to say that. Don't put a picture of a fishbone diagram in your CAPA form because you might not use a fishbone diagram. And if you want to learn more about root cause training, there's a link at the bottom there for an article that I wrote on root cause analysis tools where I talked about some of these different methods and why you would use them and why you wouldn't. But I'll go quickly through these in the next few slides. The first one's 5Y analysis. This is an example that is... Uh, supposed to be somewhat similar to what happened in the Firestone uh, tire blowouts that uh, caused some deaths. And uh, there was a big lawsuit and there were recalls, but why were the tires blowing out at 20,000 miles? They didn't blow out right away, they didn't blow out late, they blew out mid-cycle through the, the what's expected life cycle of the tire. So why are they happening there? And it turned out when they investigated how the tires were blowing out, they were blowing out on the sidewalls, and they determined when they got some samples of these tires that the tire sidewalls were too thin. Well, they measured these sidewalls in manufacturing, and they found out, oh, the calipers that we're using to measure these, even though we said it was in spec, it didn't match what we were actually seeing. The calipers are out of tolerance. Well, these aren't your average ordinary calipers. They're special ones for measuring a tire sidewall. Uh, they have to be fairly large, and they have to be designed to go around the, the tire. And so uh, you need special training on how to use this. Well, unfortunately, the calibration technician that was supposed to be doing the calibration on these was not trained to the most current procedure on that. And when they investigated further, the reason why that person wasn't trained is because the HR person that was supposed to update the training records and send the, an announcement that, hey, you need retraining, I had been laid off, so the training records had not been kept up to date. Um, so what was the real root cause? Well, it depends on how far you went in your 5Y analysis. But what you'll find, if you go deep enough, a lot of times you're going to find it's lack of management oversight, lack of management commitment, lack of training, lack of resources. But very seldom is it something like the calipers were out of tolerance or the calipers were broken because there's supposed to be controls in place to prevent though even when something goes wrong from that actually causing a problem with the product. So it's usually something more fundamental in the quality system that's a problem. 
Another tool that you can use is an is is not analysis. This is a great tool to use when you have no idea what caused the problem. It's a great screening tool to help you narrow your focus of your investigation. And so if you see the problem over on one production line, but you don't see it anywhere else, that's is is not analysis. Where is the problem occurring? Where is the problem not occurring? What products are not affected? What problems are affected? That's an is, is not analysis. You're looking for the opposite in, as well as your uh, original question. So see if you can figure out where it, what production line it's not occurring on, which product it's not occurring on, which people, which shift. Those are all things that you might look at. The next tool is a fishbone diagram. Some people call this an Ishikawa diagram. Some people call it a cause and effect diagram. Those are valid names. Some people think of this as the six M's to help them remember, but I'm not sure I would even consider environmental factors being mother nature every time, but that is the six M's. They use mother nature for environment. Um, measurement it can also be your, your calibration. Uh, machines can also be equipment. Uh, methods can also be procedure. Manpower is often people. So depending on what word you use here, but it's basically using a systematic approach to narrow down where could the problem be coming from. And so if you're not seeing any problem with this material on any other product line, so you're sort of combining two tools here, the is, is not, and the fishbone, then you can rule out uh, materials. If you're not seeing any problems with this caliper on any other area, maybe it's not the measurement technique. So uh, if you look at your data logging on environmental monitoring, you might see absolutely no change. You can rule out mother nature. Um, if the same person has been doing it all along, unlikely that it's manpower. So those are the kinds of tools that you can use and an approach you can use to try and narrow down where is this problem coming from when you don't know. Both the is, is not and the fishbone diagrams are great tools to use when you don't know. Oftentimes are used for complaint analysis or uh, recalls and non-conforming material analysis when, when the engineers just don't know what's going on. Here's another tool. It's called brainstorming. Um, so we get a bunch of people in a room and we brainstorm all the possible ways that this could be happening and what could be causing it. And then somebody organizes them all into categories. So when they're done with the brainstorming, now we call it affinity diagrams. Because we've taken all the ideas and we've categorized them. And those categories could be the six M's. So each category, you could have six categories, and you could put all your brainstorming ideas under the appropriate categories, and now you take a brainstorming session and morph it into a fishbone diagram. The next tool is a Pareto analysis. This one is the most common used for when you're trying to reduce a quality problem. So this is a known quality problem. We're having problems with, let's say, batteries wearing out too frequently. Well, look at all the things that could be causing it and quantify each one, and then when you go back and implement corrective actions, you're going to want to work on the one that is the most common. There might be multiple reasons, but you can't worry about all 12 of them. Just worry about the one that is the biggest factor, and then go on to number two. And oftentimes, if you get to number three, you're pretty lucky. Um, one other point, I put a uh, picture of this book here, 80-20 principle. This is a great book explaining the, the uh, Pareto analysis and Pareto tools and the 80-20 principle. Um, so if you're interested in that book, uh, there's a picture of it. And you can, of course, find that on Amazon where everything is. And our next slide here is effectiveness checks. So we're going to cover this a little bit later in a, another presentation where we talk about um, how to do effectiveness checks. Though this month we're recording the one on uh, root cause analysis tools. Next month we're going to release a, another one on effectiveness checks. But those two sessions together are the training on Kappa. And there are some other slides, of course, um, about the other parts of the Kappa process. But it was I'm finding a lot of companies are having trouble with root cause analysis and doing effectiveness checks. So I thought I'd give out a little freebie for those two areas. And if you find it really helpful, please sign up for the full course. Um, if you need any help with 43, so for instance, the FDA is in there now, you might give me a call. And like this last weekend, I can spend the weekend working on your 43 plans and help you uh, get them in in a timely manner and come up with some corrective action plans. 
And if you need help with your CAMPA program, because you might have a 43 related to your CAMPA process, I can help you with training on that as well. And uh, if I can help you with anything else, please let me know. And uh, if you can't get a hold of me, get a hold of Glenn Melvin. Thank you and have a nice day.